This program is brought to you by Emory University. Ladies and gentlemen, if I could get your attention, I would like to go ahead and start this wonderful event. Welcome to Emory Law School. My name is Frank Alexander, and on behalf of all of Emory Law School and the Center for the Study of Law and Religion, I'm delighted to welcome you to the 2007 Curry Lecture. The Center for the Study of Law and Religion was created roughly 25 years ago here at Emory. Our center is committed to the interaction of law and religion, to an examination of the issues, the practices, the policies, the history, and the future. We are convinced that law and religion have multiple dimensions. We take our work in part from the work of our colleague Harold Berman, that there are religious dimensions of law and legal dimensions of religion, that law and religion interact in institutional ways, in professional ways, in interdisciplinary ways, in international ways. We teach a variety of courses. We involve 75 professors throughout this university. We have four joint degree programs, and we're actively engaged with hundreds of scholars and practitioners throughout this country and through the world. Today's, Curry is, today's lecture is part of the Curry Lecture Series, which was begun in 1986 in honor of Overton Curry. Over the past 15 to 20 years, we've had a range of national and international speakers as part of this lecture series. Martin Marty, Des Desmond Tutu, John Noonan, Stephen Carter, Bill Fagey, and many others. We are delighted today to have our colleague Abdullahi Anaim as the Curry Lecturer for 2007. But first, before I introduce Abdullahi Anaim, I want to express our deep appreciation to the Curry family for making this lecture series possible. I know that Martha DeLuca is here, and Lucy, I don't see Lucy yet, um, Andy Curry, Terry Banta, and others will also be here. So please join me in thanking the Curry family for making this possible. Abdullahi Anaim is known throughout the world for his courage, his grace, his compassion, his wisdom. We like to think that this is due to Abdu, but we realize it's due to his family members. And I'm delighted today that Aisha Osman and Ali and Ahmed Anaim are with us because they're the ones who are teaching our brother Abdullahi Anaim as much as anything. So thank you, members of his family, for being with us today. <laughs> Charles ha Howard Candler, professor of law. Professor Anaim joined the Emory Law School faculty in 1995 on a full-time basis. Prior to that, he did preparatory work while teaching at a school like Harvard and uh, UCLA and other law schools throughout the world. His JD from Khartoum, Advanced Legal Studies um, from, Edinburgh, no, from Cambridge, and his doctorate from Edinburgh. He has written over 15 books and 50 articles translated into more languages than I can count. Prior to coming to Emory, he was director from 1993 to 95 of Human Rights Watch Africa. For the past two days, I had the privilege of sitting in in a roundtable discussion with 15 Islamic scholars discussing Professor Anaim's work on the future of the Sharia. I learned more than I ever thought I would in those two days of simple discussions. But some of the things I learned are simply the magnitude of Professor Anaim's task in his work that he's sharing with us today. Because Professor Anaim believes in theological authority rather than authoritarian theology, he is the Martin Luther for the Islamic faith. Because Professor Anaim believes 
in the importance of the neutral secular state. He is the Thomas Jefferson for the Islamic faith. Because Professor Anaim is deeply convinced of the importance of the Islamic faith for our actions, our policies, our rules, our procedures, he is the Menachem Elan for the Islamic faith. In all that he does, he exhibits compassion and courage and grace. I am deeply honored to be one of Professor Anaim's students. He is my mentor, our mentor. He is my teacher, our teacher. But above all, I am so thankful that Professor Anaim is our friend and our brother and is here with us today. Alhamdulillah, Professor Anaim. Please join me. Thank you so much, Frank. Uh, let me start by disclaiming much of what Frank said in his very generous and very eloquent introduction. And I think that it will come up, I hope, in my remarks later on, but often that we need to take things in perspective, and that perspective needs to be deeper historically. And humans, in the Quran, the Quran says humans are impatient. We need to be patient and to see things in perspective. And when we do, we will see the real Martin, Luther King, Martin Luther's and Martin Luther King's of the Muslim world. We will see the Thomas Jefferson's of the Muslim world. My point is that uh, transformation often is appreciated in retrospect. And probably now we are too close and too involved in the events to appreciate their true dimension and, and, and significance. But I should have started, and I do always start with Assalamu Alaikum. Now, peace to you all, assalamu alaikum, is in fact the universal greeting of Muslims. Everywhere, every day, all the time. In fact, a Muslim, when finishing the prayer five times a day, at the end of the prayer, you will say, assalamu alaikum, assalamu alaikum, assalamu alaikum. And this uh, imperative of diffusion of peace and sustenance of peace and sharing of peace is in fact the requirement, the fundamental requirements of being a Muslim. Now I realize of course it is not that simple and I realize that most Muslims including myself have not lived up to this probably most of the time. But in speaking about Islam, this is what it is. Uh, in speaking about Muslims, then we are speaking about human beings with all that is good and bad about being human. And I take it that the good will last and prevail and the bad will be overcome. But let me go on to, to present some of my remarks and I hope that we will have a good time for discussion and questions and so on. I think that f for my, uh, and in fact I would like to acknowledge my own teacher, my own mentor, Ustaz Mahmoud Muhammad Taha of Sudan, who always taught us that it is fear and ignorance that lies at the base of all behavioral um, sort of deviances, that we as human beings are driven when, uh, by fear and ignorance into the, the, the deviance that we do, and therefore understanding why Muslims fail to live up to what is imperative of their religion is because of fear and ignorance, but also how others also are affected by that. Now, a little mention of my dress. It is elegant, and that's why I wear it. But I also wish to make a statement with this, which is, I am a Muslim, I'm an African Muslim from Northern Sudan. And I speak as an African Muslim from Northern Sudan. And I am privileged to be a citizen of a country where I can be an African American Muslim from Sudan originally. So I'm an African American Muslim. As an African-American Muslim, this is the way I would like to dress, and this is how I see myself. And I need to be accepted as such. And I willing and I respectfully 
would also concede the same to all those who wish to be who they are. And for me, it is a true privilege and honor to be part of this wonderful community, Emory Law School, which has given me a home. By the way, I have been wondering, Frank have been generous. These appointments were out of need rather than out of choice. I would have rather had a home to stay since I had to leave Sudan in the mid-80s. And Emory Law School and Emory University gave me a home. So this is now my home. And it is as B who is here in my home. So I'm truly grateful and honored to be part of this faculty, to be part of this community, and to be part of the students and wider community of Emory Law School and Emory University. But also my sense is that always privilege entails responsibility. And so again, in my face, that you honor your blessing by paying thank and gratitude by doing what is required and expected of your position and your privilege and your advantage. So it is in that sense that I will be trying to achieve a level of, and I do mean this sincerely with all humility, that when I challenge, I don't seek to offend, but only seek to acknowledge my privilege and seek to share the privilege that others have. And as a Muslim American, I challenge the monopoly to define who is a Muslim or who is an American. That is, the privilege of being an American is for me to say, I define who is American for myself, as every other American has the right to do so. And as a Muslim, I say I have the right to define what Islam is to me, as every Muslim has the right to do so. And this should, in fact, be the universal reality of human beings. It should be possible and if true of all of us everywhere to be who we are and to be comfortable and to be confident and to be happy as who we are. It is not the reality in most places. And it may not permanently remain to be the reality of this place if we do not stand up to the obligation and the privilege of being Americans, whoever, whatever affiliation we have. My point being that it is when, as we look around the world, we will see most people are denied the privilege that we claim as of right. But my, my question is, what is the, the corresponding obligation to that privilege? And this is the, the sense in which I speak and take advantage of this great honor of the Kerry Lecture Platform. The primary audience of the project that I will be trying to highlight briefly, are Muslims everywhere. Uh, because, and there is a reason why, because for me as a Muslim, that's where my obligation is. That's where I stand. That's for what I am responsible, or for which I am responsible. That's why I, my primary audience are Muslims. And I do travel and I do speak to Muslims all over the world. But also I would like to emphasize that my audience is also human beings everywhere because I do not accept a lasting or permanent dichotomy uh, in terms of race or gender or class or religion. And that we are ultimately all human. It is that our shared humanity that compels me to seek to present ideas, to seek understanding and compassion and respect among human beings everywhere. The process of the project is intended to reach out to Muslims. So we have uh, on a website that you can access from Emory uh, Law School um, homepage, a project where you can actually find the full text of the, full, of the book manuscript that is on this subject in English, but also translations in nine languages. That is Arabic, French, uh, Italian, uh, sorry, uh, Russian, Turkish, uh, Bahasa, Indonesia, Bengali, Urdu, and we are adding Swahili, and we will keep adding languages. The point is to reach Muslims in their languages and to be able to respond and to react and to critique from the website in their language without having to know English. So that is the, the blessing of technology and the blessing of being at Emory and at Emory Law School and part of the Law and Religion Project or program in that I have the facility to be able to reach across the world Muslims in their languages 
and to hear from them in their languages. And that is something that I would like to, to come on, to refer to and emphasize later on. But my point at this stage is to say, yes, I'm here addressing you, but my primary audience are Muslims, but I do not take that to be uh, exclusive uh, or in any way exceptional. And I think that is one of the problems that we have to address, a notion of exclusivity and a notion of exceptionalism. And you know, I'm sure that some types of exceptionalism that some of us may claim for being American. My point is that the ultimate is being human. And exclusivity and exceptionalism undermines our shared humanity. So we should seek understanding, we should seek affirmation of our humanity in, respect, in our respective traditions and context. It is not to deny difference. In fact, difference is permanent and to me is valuable. It is to be treasured and celebrated. It is not that human beings will ever be uh, without difference, but it is how can we keep our difference while sustaining our humanity and promoting our humanity. In fact, being different is human. And, being, and seeking to be the same, to, to, to be treated with equality and dignity is also human. One of the most eloquent uh, definitions of human rights is by my senior South African uh, scholar, Albi Sachs, who will actually will be at Emory in a week or so, who said human rights are about the right to be the same and the right to be different. It is as much my human right to be different as it is to be the same, to be treated with the same equal dignity. And that entails being treated as who I am. Now these ideas, I'm not taking, uh, sort of presenting simply as moral ideals. These are very pragmatic and very practical uh, considerations that it is out of a moral imperative as it is out of a practical imperative and practical necessity and pragmatic necessity that we should seek to honor, we should seek to understand each other and to, to, to appreciate our difference in the same way that we claim it for ourselves to, to concede it to others. To clarify then the, my uh, sort of subject specifically for this lecture is that, uh, as I said, my, my audience are generally Muslims at large, but I very much take it to be uh, integral to that, that those who of us who are not Muslims are equally entitled to participate in this debate among Muslims. I do not accept exclusivity of discourse so that Muslims only can talk about Islam or to other Muslims and Christians, talk to other Christians and Jews to other Jews. I think that our shared humanity and the pragmatic reality of our sharing this planet requires us to be able to speak so long as we do so with knowledge, with respect, and with compassion. And it is never wrong to judge the other. It is always wrong in, when we judge on mistaken understanding or information or out of bias and, and prejudice. And that is where we need to, effort, to expand our effort. What I, I would like to present today is, is something in the, in the nature of what might be called the predicament of Muslims today regarding Islam. Now, people who are Muslims have many predicaments. I'm sure that we are all familiar with uh, social, economic, political issues that all human societies and persons face everywhere. So I'm not talking about Muslims at large in relation to everything. I'm talking about the Islamic dimension of the predicament of Muslims. In what way Islam is relevant and in what way it is uh, paradoxical and problematic for Muslims. And in that sense, I would like I would try to, to try to present, and I realize this is a diverse audience, to try to present my remarks in a way that uh, for all of us to be able to follow, but hopefully for those who may wish to pursue some specific aspects, we can do so in uh, our discussion. When I speak of Muslims, not Islam, I mean Muslims in their historical context, in their socio-economic and political context. And that's why I don't think that it's very helpful to speak about Islam at large, in any sense, especially among Muslims who, who often tend to speak of Islam in as much an essentializing and simplifying uh, approach as uh, others do. Now, I'm not here to defend Islam or to solve the Islam problem, whether for Muslims or non-Muslims. 
it is not my pretension to defend Islam, and I do not believe that Islam needs to be defended. And I will explain what I mean by that more uh, in later on. But the point is that Islam is a world religion to which, uh, with which one-fifth of the total humanity subscribe or as, uh, identify. That is, one in every five persons is a Muslim. According to the CIA uh, facts uh, uh, book, there are more than 44, at least 44 countries where Muslims are the majority of the population. So we are talking about one-fifth of the total world population, and we are talking about one quarter of the membership of the United Nations, for example. So it is a huge and highly complex uh, global community. It's a, a, a world religion which has uh, been a foundational uh, a framework for civilizations of many people for 1,500 years. So one cannot speak about Islam as this and Islam of the other with the view of the last 10, 15, 20, 100 years, 200 years. Now, throughout that history, Muslims have been extremely diverse. And just simply to note a fact, like there are four, 40 million Muslim Chinese what do we know about them, their lifestyle? I'm not saying we, I mean we the Muslims, whether of the Middle East or of the Sub-Saharan Africa region or any region, that we do not as much know, know as ourselves and or our own community as much as we should, and neither do others. So we should be sort of humble and, and really respectful of this extreme diversity, which is a permanent feature of all human societies. And specifically regarding this audience here, I think it is incoherent to speak about Islam and the West. It's incoherent. It does not make sense. There is no conflict or clash between Islam and the West. Islam is a world religion. The West is a geopolitical region. You can coherently speak of Islam and Christianity or Islam and Judaism or Islam and Hinduism as religions if you can do so with any coherence, that is. But it is totally incoherent to speak about Islam and the West. Islam is a Western religion for those who study the field of religion. So it is really incoherent. And again, it is not productive. And, and for that reason, I will emphasize, with, to emphasize talking about Muslims and their history, their experiences, their context. That is where I think I will be focusing my remarks. Uh, and I will very much try to move away from simplification, and, um, but I'm sorry that I will also slip into generalizations that I'm sure the scholars among us will, will find me at fault with. But the point for me is to try to highlight these points and keep them in mind, especially when I slip into more careless language as I speak. I think a very significant aspect of the condition of or the predicament of Muslims in the present era is what I call the post-colonial condition. And post-coloniality or the post-colonial condition is not, I find, often appreciated by Americans. Because for Americans, colonialism, for most Americans at least, not the Native Americans probably, but for other Americans, colonialism is a positive experience. Uh, it is, it is, some people might think of it as a, of a style of furniture, style of architecture. And our colonial history, our colonial fathers, and this and that. But for most the world, most part of the world, and most of humanity, colonialism was an extremely traumatizing experience, a disruptive and destructive experience. And I do not speak only, of course, of foreign colonialism, especially European colonialism. Often, we have inherited and we have perpetuated internal colonialism among ourselves. And as a Sudanese, I acknowledge that to be true. But the point is that to think of the post-colonial condition, the reality of how Muslim societies today are post-colonial, even those which were not formally colonized, like Saudi Arabia or Iran or Turkey. It's a, the post-colonial condition is a socioeconomic political phenomenon that we can study and understand and that we know applies equally across the world from Latin America to Southeast Asia to other parts of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So it is, it is that sense, and for that I think that what is a critical issue here is that Muslims have come to live with a European conception of the state and a European conception of law 
and its confusion regarding the nature of the state as we have it today and the nature of law as we have it today is really underlying the tension and the confusion about Sharia as I'll try to explain. But we do have this post-colonial condition in which underdevelopment, poverty, lack of weak in institutions are shared experiences and shared phenomena that we can consider in understanding the predicament of specific Muslim societies and communities. A phenomenon of, we talk about democratization, we talk about human rights protection, we talk about constitutionalism, and you can see part of Hawaii, at least in my view, most of Hawaii Muslims are, have, having, have problems with that is not peculiar to Muslims, and therefore we have to consider other factors in the process. I will be now looking more in terms of the notion of Islam, Sharia, and law. I mean, why, why do I say the future of Sharia? Because Sharia is not law. And often, uh, the, in fact, in American law schools, as I teach a course in this, I say Islamic law. But there is, it, this is deeply misleading because Islamic law is not an accurate translation of the term Sharia. Sharia is a total normative system for Muslims. It governs every aspect from belief and uh, religious doctrine and, and theology into where she practices, into social etiquette. It's a comprehensive way of life, but it's a normative, not a legal frame for Muslims to live by. Now, another feature that I will mention immediately is that uh, Islam is not synonymous with Sharia either. So, so Sharia is not Islam. Sharia is a historically conditioned understanding of Islam. That is, Sharia is a product of history, of human understanding in history. And it cannot sort of conceptually be otherwise. Islam is a scriptural religion. Uh, actually closer to Judaism than Christianity in that regard in terms of the relationship between the text and the doctrine. The Quran is the foundational text to which all Muslims accept, myself I accept as we believe as a final revelation of God subhanahu wa ta'ala, God to humanity through the Prophet Muhammad. And then the Sunnah of the Prophet, which is the lifestyle, the example of the Prophet, is the second primary source. In fact, although it is uh, sort of, in terms of a sort of hierarchy of sources, it could be second to the Quran, but in terms of substance and content, it by far exceeds the Quran in terms of its normative impact on how Muslim faith and tradition came to be articulated. But the point is that Islam, as based in the Quran and Sunnah, first for us Muslims in subsequent generations as of today, to know what the Quran is, is a product of human consensus. That is, we believe the Quran to have been revealed by God, but how do we know that what we read now as a Mus'haf is in fact what was revealed? It is the belief that this text was handed down from generation to generation for the last 1,500 years among Muslims. So therefore, the, the notion of human consensus is in fact critical to the possibility of having the Quran authenticated as the legitimate and authoritative text. And that applies equally to Sunnah, the Prophet's example, which is also more problematic because it remained as a, an oral tradition for several generations because it, before it was recorded. And the controversies about what is authentic or not authentic sunnah continues among Muslims. But for me, the point here is to emphasize consensus as not only an aspect of the evolution of Sharia and the, the origins and founding of Sharia, as I will try to briefly explain, but also as even regarding the description of sources themselves. The authority is in the human chain of consensus intergenerational consensus, I call it, rather than simply because we don't have, it wasn't an attachment that we received with an email that says this is the Quran. It is the fact that generation after generation of Muslims narrate and memorize and hand down the Quran. In fact, the Quran is in its reading, not in its text, from Iqra, Qara, from the recitation of it, not its text in the Arabic language and so on. But 
now when you come to the notion of Sharia, my claim here is that for any religion to be relevant, it has to be interpreted by human beings through their experiences and their, their human comprehension. So in, in, in ironically or paradoxically, religion ceases to be divine in order to be relevant to the human. It becomes secularized in the process of transforming and understanding it to live by it. It is not that it loses its transcendental divine aspect in the, in the, according to the belief of the believers, but as far as we are concerned, concerned in this life, there is no way to know the Quran except through our human understanding. There is no way to understand the Sunnah except through our human interpretation of it. And how we invoke Sunnah and how we quote the Quran is our human judgment. That is why I make the claim that many Muslims may find to be heretical that Sharia is secular. It's a product of secular experience, this worldly experience, and cannot be otherwise. Because as far as it, the Quran may remain, and there is a verse in the Quran I can cite for those who are familiar, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Hamim, wal kitab al-Mubin, inna ja'annahu Qur'anan arabiyan la'allakum ta'qilun, wa innahu fi umul kitab ladayna la'aliyun hakim. And to roughly translate is to say that we have revealed the Quran in the Arabic language for you to understand. But the essence of the Quran remains with the divine beyond human comprehension. But the point is that it is la'allakum ta'qilun, so that you understand. That is the object of revealing the Quran in a human language. And it is a human language. And therefore it's a product of history. And the understanding of it is a product of history. Now, the propositions that I seek to promote uh, in, in, through the project uh, is the notion that Sharia has a future. In my mind, there is no doubt about this. I mean, I'm not questioning in the least. In fact, my whole object is to fulfill the future of Sharia, to secure the future, to promote the future of Sharia. But that can only be outside the framework of the state. So my claim is that Sharia is too important to be entrusted to the state and to the claim of the state to be able to enforce it. Second proposition, I will highlight them, uh, mention them briefly and then try to explain some of them, that Sharia remain contested and constantly evolving. It is not a stagnant, it is not a fixed understanding because if it, it is, then it ceases to be relevant and it dies. So if you believe in the, 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 the continuity of the relevance of Sharia, we have to accept its possibility of constant evolution and transformation according to our human needs. To the extent that Sharia responds to my needs, it is relevant and it is valid. To the extent it does not, it, then it is not relevant and it's not valid. But Sharia cannot be enforced by the state. By that I mean a Sharia principle ceases to be Sharia by the very act of enacting it as law. So the, 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 the whole idea of enacting a statute as Sharia is a contradiction. By enacting it, you are removing the quality of being Sharia because it becomes the political will of the state and not the normative, uh, normative system of Islam. For that, I'm saying that the notion of an Islamic state is incoherent. The state cannot be religious, ever. I'm saying I'm, I make these wild claims and as I remind me of my overstate uh, generalizations. My claim is that the notion of a religious state is incoherent and historically false. The state cannot be religious. The state can, does not have, it's not a human being who has a conscience and a belief, uh, sort of to be able to believe and to be religious in that sense. Now the claim is made of it said being religious, but that does not make the claim valid because it is made. Specifically regarding Islamic societies, my claim is that there has never been an Islamic state, not a single day. That the state was always a political institution. If you speak of a state, then you are talking about a political institution. And you cannot talk about a religious political institution in the sense that it, does, it cannot be a religion. 
or be affiliated with a religion in that sense. Now, to say a state cannot be religious does not mean that every state is secular. I would like to believe, or in, a, in one sense one can speak of every state because we tend to think of the secular as the opposite of religious. So if the state is not religious, then it must be secular. In, in a sense that is true, but it's confusing because we have to understand secularism or a secular state in a particular way, and many states do not qualify for being secular states. So for that reason I say a state cannot be religious. One second point is that many states which by definition are not religious do not yet or may not be sufficiently secular states. And my project is to promote the secular state as an imperative of the possibility of being Muslim. I need a secular state to be Muslim because I can only be Muslim by choice. And can, the state can never coercively enforce piety or nobody can in that sense. So in that sense, I'm saying that the state is not religious by definition. Whether a state is secular enough or not remains to be seen and also to be contested. And this is something that we can struggle with. Now, this, I'm not suggesting in the least that Sharia is to be relevant. In fact, Sharia will remain a fundamental socializing force, a fundamental normative source and normative system for Muslims everywhere. A Muslim is bound to observe Sharia no matter what. Whatever else is going on, we never cease to be responsible for upholding Sharia. But we can never do so except by choice, voluntarily. And any coerced piety, coerced implement conformity is by definition not religious. It, it loses the quality of being Islamic. And there is, for those who are Muslim or familiar with the term, there is a fundamental notion of niya, that is intention. No act can be religiously valid except when intended as such. And nobody can force intention. You may force me to go to the mosque to pray, but if you do, I pray to the state which forced me to go there, not to God. I cannot pray to God except when I go into the mosque voluntarily or fast voluntarily. That's why what, what I mean by I need a secular state to be Muslim. Um, so Sharia remains a normative ethical underpinning of social life, and it will be a source of law and policy, but only when filtered and adopted through what I used to call public reason until this weekend. We had this uh, sort of workshop around the manuscript and the term public reason was seen to be problematic for what it evokes in Western liberal thought. Some thought it was good, some thought it was bad, some thought it was incoherent. So I think by the end of the meeting we resolved to call it civic or, or civil reason, not public reason. And by civil reason, I mean that no, state, no policy or law should be enacted or, enact or Im implemented by the state except when it is adopted through political constitutional institutions through a process of pub or civil reason. By civil reason, we mean that a process of giving reasons and the process of reasoning that is equally accessible to all citizens without reference to religious belief. So you cannot say enforce this because God said so, because that's what you think or what you believe. I may disagree with that. If you want me to do so as a matter of state policy or state law, then you have to articulate reasons that are persuasive to me as a citizen without reference to my or your, or your religious belief. I'm sure that you, many of you will appreciate the overlaps with, with, with notions of public reason. But to be uh, briefly here is to say that I don't like the, the notion of public reason partly also because it, it seeks to prescribe what is persuasive. That is, it, it tends to, I mean, when, especially when political philosophers like Raoul and Habermas sort of go into these elaborations they, 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 they tend to stipulate what people will find persuasive or not, what people will find. And, and by, by, by definition, I think that is, in fact, a, a contradictory project. So I would rather leave it to people to decide what is persuasive. And it is not that it's going to be 
uh, obviously my hope is that it will be civil and not sort of religious doctrine that is invoked. But that is something that we achieve over time through a process of cultivating public discourse and securing public discourse. And for that, I, I very much, and I learn from American constitutionalism, and I also learn from the global tradition of human rights and citizenship. And, and those experiences all over the world are experiences by which we try to safeguard the space where people can debate the basis of public, public policy and legislation without coercion of any sort. Uh, I think that the, this idea is really is about the religious neutrality of the state, meaning that the state should be neutral regarding religious doctrine. That is not to say the state should be hostile or supportive. It is just simply to be neutral, neither privileging nor disadvantaging religious doctrine. The state should be the guardian of a debate among the believers of the community into what the religious doctrine is, but should not prescribe what that doctrine should be. Now, obviously, the notion of neutrality is beyond the human. That is, we cannot be totally neutral. But we have to strive to be as far as the institutions that preserve our ability to believe what we wish to believe. In other words, that the notions of constitutionalism, human rights, and citizenship are pragmatic approaches to securing the neutrality of the state against the impulse of those who control the state to appropriate it to their own ends and so on. So it is a pragmatic ideal, meaning that it's a process that we can engage in and try to promote. There is a paradox, of course, in what I'm saying, because part of my proposition is that the state must be separated from religion institutionally. But religion cannot be separated from politics. That is, the state and religion is a dangerous mix. But the state, I mean religion and politics, are inseparable. You cannot have religion out of politics anywhere, including in this country, obviously. So here we are dealing with a paradox. How can we keep the state separate from religion in the reality of connectedness between religion and politics? And that is what I mean by, by negotiating this paradox through institutions like constitutionalism and so on. One of the ideas I use is to try to distinguish between politics and the state. Politics you might think of as the government of the day. Whereas the state is the continuity, the institutional continuity of a state functions and organs that transcend or hopefully transcend the dictates of the politics of the day. And we are struggling with this everywhere all the time. To the extent that every gov government seeks to appropriate, including this one, meaning government of Georgia and government of the United States, will try to appropriate the state to its own political project. Our struggle as citizens is to de deny that and to frustrate that effort. So the question is how can we keep sort of the state, which is a political institution, as institutionalized as possible, possible though that it can transcend the politics of the day? Because to allow the, state, the, the government of the day to collapse the state into the politics of the day is a very dangerous, that is what authoritarianism is, that is what totalitarianism is. And therefore the, 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 the struggle is to, to promote that possibility. Uh, again, there is another paradox or dilemma between morality and law. Where does morality end and law begin? Those are issues that I think people have to struggle with. Now, if I may, just to inject a point here, and I, I do try to keep to the time that we agreed, in my belief, the United States is more of an Islamic state than any state in the world that claims to be an Islamic state. By that I mean Saudi Arabia is not an Islamic state. Iran is not an Islamic state. Sudan is not an Islamic state, and so on. Because to the extent that the state denies the right of Muslims to believe as they please or not to believe, and by the way, Belief logically requires the possibility of disbelief. You cannot believe unless you can disbelieve. 
logically. So my claim is that to the extent that the United States is a secular state, and that some of you of us may be the sort of dispute that at least sometimes in regarding some issues, but it is more of a secular state in the sense of a more of a state that is neutral regarding religious doctrine than any of the states where Muslims are a majority and claim to be an Islamic state, or not claim an Islamic state. That is, globally speaking, that's why I say to be an American give me more possibility of being Muslim than being a citizen of many of these states where the state is not real neutral regarding religious doctrine. But of course, I'm talking about the state as such, as an institution. But the politics, the society, and so on, you'll have issues with that. But that is not my point for now, at least. Now, uh, coming to closing, to say that my obligation in promoting this project is to be persuasive. And there is a question of my obligation to be persuasive and my ability to be persuasive. Because my project is lost. It is meaningless if it is not persuasive to Muslims in the first place and to others who can support Muslims in their struggle. But the, the, the obligation and the desire is not necessarily consistent or uh, similar, uh, the same as the ability to be persuasive. I strive to be persuasive regarding the legitimacy of my argument, meaning that I try to promote, and uh, 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 that's why I call, I call it, excuse me, secularism from an Islamic perspective. So I try to present an Islamic argument for secularism. And I think I tried to, to outline that. That I'm promoting this as a Muslim in order to be Muslim. My claim, my challenge to so-called Islamic fundamentalism or an Islamic state or the enforcement of Sharia by the state is from an Islamic perspective. I say this denies my possibility of being a Muslim. Now, many of the ideas I'm saying, and that is good, are not totally new, obviously. But neither are they totally accepted, at least among Muslims. That we do have an intellectual history that is very rich, in which all of these ideas have been debated by Muslim scholars 1,000 years ago, 800 years ago. People like Al Ibn Rushd, Al Farabi, Al Ghazali, and the Mu'tazila tradition, and many others. So these ideas, and during our weekend of discussions, we, uh, we had several Muslim scholars who kept citing to us that, but so-and-so said so 800 years ago, or 700 years ago. My point is, uh, that is fine, I will seek that to fortify my argument, but for that to be relevant today, it has to be translated, in, in not only in terms of language, but in terms of experience so that it has coherence in the state, cent uh, state societies which ha are post-colonial societies. Um, and these ideas, uh, profound as they are, are little known, little appreciated among Muslims. And until we do, then we cannot just simply recite those ideas as a way out of our predicament when in fact they are not. Now when I said translate, because I mean that there has been a fundamental epistemological transformation and shift. Muslim societies in the post-colonial are very different, drastically different from Muslim society historically. Now we are much more urbanized, by far. I mean that Cairo, or Karachi, 17, 16 million people in a city. That is unprecedented in Muslim history, even, even smaller towns. So the scale of demographics, social factors, industrialization, urbanization, and education. Those are fundamental uh, shifts in our societies. That's why we need to translate Ibn, 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 uh, Ibn Rushd or any of or Ghazali into a coherent language for today's Muslim in relation to their issues, not in, in abstractions. The global uh, context of the territorial state, I would like to call it rather than the, 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 the nation state, because the nation is a very problematic idea, but territorial state is coherent. So the United States is a territorial state, it's not a nation state. There is no United, nation, United States nation. Well, there is of course a, a myth that there is a nation, but it is not true in, with all due respect. And, and this is true everywhere. The notion, of the notion of nation is very problematic. It is by, by inherently uh, sort of um, 
authoritarian and, and, and sort of hegemonic. Because what happens is that some privileged cultural group and ethnic group will claim the name of the, nat the nation and speak in the name of the nation. And that's what, but anyway, that is maybe a side issue. But my point is that my discourse has to be challenging, but it also has to be accessible. And there have to be conducive conditions, meaning that locally and globally, the conditions have to be conducive to a, a free discourse and dialogue. Now, here I come to, to conclude to say I do not intend to offend. I seek to challenge with all due respect and humility. And I, I also claim that you know, there is no point in my coming here and bringing you all out with, and thank you for being here if I'm going to tell you exactly what you already agree with and accept. Okay, so let me finish with upsetting some of us, I hope. <laughs> I believe that if I'm not challenging and challenged, I'm not relevant. So that is the spirit in which I am saying this. My point is what, what can Americans do? And of course, I mean, you can, you can understand that I do have very strong views on what's going on globally now, especially regarding the United States and its foreign policy. But I'm trying to be more objective, hopefully, or also more, more uh, reaching out in conversation. Again, I recall that I'm here honoring my privilege, that I'm privileged to be addressing you, and I would not waste this privilege by telling you what you already accept and agree with. And I also talk about our privilege, all of us in this room probably who are American, that this is a high privilege. What do we owe for it? What do we owe humanity for the privilege of being Americans? And, but my point is also pragmatic. It's not only to appeal to your moral sensibility, but also to appeal to our and your pragmatic needs and considerations. This is what we need to do, and this is what we ought to do. And there is no difference between the two. My point, one point is that the dichotomy between so-called foreign policy and domestic policy is collapsing very fast. And 9-11, if it has one of the main points that it made the silver lining problem, is to bring an awareness that there is no distinction between foreign policy and, and domestic policy. What you do abroad will come home. And what we do at home will go abroad. So that is one point. My question is about democratic accountability, especially for foreign policy. And my claim is that, with all due respect, the government of the United States is not democratically accountable to the people of the United States. And no government will ever surrender to being accountable. Every government has to be brought to accountability. It is not going to come to accountability voluntarily. And we betray our obligations and rights and privileges as citizens by failing to affirm and assert our right to hold our government accountable. And we have to realize that a lot of myths keep playing out in the media, in our popular political discourse, to lull us into the sort of the belief that we are in fact holding our government accountable. But are we really doing so? And we, oh, there are issues I'm sure that you are aware of them very much in the news today and these days, which will bring this point home. Where is this accountability taking place? To, to, in what ways is it sustained consistently and constantly? Basically my conclusion therefore it is it is our human agency and responsibility that makes all the difference. That is, there is nothing good or bad that happens except through our human agency. Nothing good or bad happens except us through our human agency. I'm not saying, of course, that earthquakes don't happen or tsunamis do not happen, but I mean, as far as human affairs are concerned, whatever is good or bad is by virtue of a human being doing or failing to do. And by the way, failing to do is standing on the sidelines and disclaiming responsibility will not, it is a choice. Failing to take a, make a choice is a choice. Failing to act is action. And there are always consequences. There are always consequences. 
and the consequences do not come according to our wishes or our desires. They come to the nature of our action. And when we defy people's dignity and violate their sovereignty and colonize them, and I have to be say this, as I said, I do not mean to insult, but I need to challenge. The United States is colonizing Iraq today as we speak and since March of 2003. Colonialism in the 19th century meaning of the term. Because colonialism is to seize sovereignty by military conquest without legal justification. To seize sovereignty over land and territory and population. And that we did by military conquest. And that we did without legal justification. And that we do not have. So whether for a day or an hour or is still continuing, the United States is the colonial power over Iraq. Now my point is the complexity of the situation well taken and respected the point is that we cannot really claim to uphold international legality. We cannot uphold international law. We cannot claim to uphold human rights. When we act with such flagrant disregard for the most fundamental principles, as they are enshrined in our own constitution and are they are enshrined in our own political culture. For that I say, and for that I conclude, by challenging us, all of us, to be compassionate, to be understanding, but to be principled. Most of all, to be principled. And to realize that whatever we do, there are consequences. And the consequences are not what we wish for, but it is in the nature of our actions. For me to be able to deliver this message to Muslims and to persuade Muslims, to be persuasive, I need you to help me uphold these principles globally especially when they are at risk. Uh, uh, people's will and commitment are not tested in normal times. They are tested in extraordinary times. If we fail our principles in, in our hardship, that is where it counts the most, not when we uphold them in, at our leisure. Thank you very much. That was one water if you would like. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Professor Anaim. You have challenged us. You have spoken words of passion and compassion. You have spoken words of grace and of freedom. One of the theologians who has taught me a great deal, besides yourself, was a German pastor in the 1930s, a pacifist, who was wrestling with the concept of what he was called to do. And in a little book, he wrote that in his tradition, my tradition, God became human, not that we could become gods, but that we could become more fully human. And that indeed is how I take your remarks today, that we indeed are called to be human. Thankfully, Professor Anaim has given us uh, permission to have a time of questions. We will have about 20 to 25 minutes of open questions. We have mics. I ask you to come to one of the mics if you're able. And if you're not able to um, get to a microphone that we have seated, please raise your hand and we'll bring you a portable mic. So the floor is now open for questions. Professor yes. Naim, <clears throat> my name is Dr. Abdullah Najjar. I have been in the United States for 64 years. I hail from Lebanon. I am a Druze Muslim. I grew up as a Druze, which is an Islamic sect. But we are also castigated in, castigated in the Islamic world because a thousand years ago, the Druze, who constitute about a million people, population in Lebanon, Syria, and Israel, and Jordan, have a thousand years ago freed slaves, gave liberty and equality to women, and 
said that separation of uh, there is no I mean, you, sep you separate uh, a church from from the country. I uh, wonder if you'd like to make comments on that. Um, I, I think the point, uh, as I said in my opening remarks, I said I seek and, and claim the right to challenge every monopoly, whether the monopoly of to define who's a Muslim or a properly to define who's an American. That if I'm an American citizen, then I have a right to define and to seek to contribute to defining what that means. And if I affirm myself as a Muslim, I have the every right to do so. And obviously that does not overlook the fact that this is, and of course, if it wasn't happening, I wouldn't say it. That is, if people are not claiming to monopolize what it is to be Muslim, I wouldn't make, need to make the point. The point is precisely in confrontation of the reality that many people seek to define others as excluded from a community that they affirm their membership of. And my, my point is that I also, you have a, um, an Emory International Journal which you, will, you have in the reading. I, you see that I say I celebrate heresy. For me, heresy is vitally important for any tradition, for any religious or other tradition, whether even ideological or political. The point is that every orthodoxy is started as a heresy. Not every heresy makes it into orthodoxy, but there is no orthodoxy that was not heresy. No orthodoxy was, that was not an, a heresy. So it is to heresy that we all, all that we believe in. How can we do without it? So heresy is not a shame or it is not a, a, a disgrace. It is a badge of honor. I seek to be a heretic and to be responsible for my heresy. So for the dominant Sunni communities of the Middle East to whom the Druze are heretical, the Druze should not feel inferior for that and challenge the claim of those who seek to demonize them for branding them as heretics. That is why we both need a secular state. That's why you and I are here. Because here we can be who we wish to be, but we have to struggle to keep it so. So don't take me wrong in the sense that it is always going to be fine here. It's only good as long as we keep it so. So I agree with you completely. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hello. It's working. Can you hear me? Professor Naeem, my name is uh, um, Amir, and I'm a physician here. A few comments and few questions I have. Um, I don't think Islam as history was ever a non-secular in its institution. Starting from Prophet's life, he went to Medina, he developed a secular state. He has Jewish and Christians in an agreement that we will fight together, we will protect together. You come to 700 years ago to Spain, uh, the Sultan of Cartaba, his private physician was Dr. Mamonides, secular state. People are living there happily, Jewish and Christians. You go to India, Mughals, 900 years of Muslim dominancy there. Majority of the population was not Muslim, it was Hindus. Islam has, as an institute, has never been a non-secular as an our current states, as you say, post-colonized Muslim states are, whatever they are, they are only for political reasons. And we don't have to, everybody knows in Iran or in Saudi I was born in one of the middle states and I know what's been happening there. I came here seven years ago and I have really learned what Islam real is, really is. And the whole credit goes to this West which I agree with you, is more Islamic than the whole hemisphere on the eastern side. One. Two, you kind of stated in the initial part of your speech, if I understood wrongly, that's my mistake, but you kind of questioned the 
authenticity of the Quranic uh, versions. Inna nahnu la zikr wa inna lahu la hafizun. We have, though we have sent down the book and we are the protectors, as in it's rough, it's a rough translation. <clears throat> it would be shortcoming on human understanding of what human mind is today that might not be able to understand and interpret the Quranic wisdom and statements. Quran is not a book of ordainment. It's a book of similarities, symbolism, science. People have made many connotations from today's scientific discoveries from Quranic book 1400 years ago. So that was human mind's limitation, not the limitation from the Quranic message. And as a Muslim, I do not think Sunnah or the teachings of Prophet peace be upon him has any superseding's on Quranic statement because Muslim scholars everywhere they might question the authenticity of a hadith or the saying of Prophet but they never have questioned what Quran says. It may be different of timing, different of environments or they have to be forced to make some different opinion on again political reasons not Islam as what it teaches us. I think that's it. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, on the on the first point, of course, um, I, I don't think it, it's not very productive to go into this contest about Cordoba or Medina or this and that, as if raising them as high examples of. But then we tend to overlook several centuries of our history conveniently and look at other spots where they were pride. The point is Muslims have, are like all the other human beings have been good and bad. They have been good times, bad times, and oppressive states and, and or societies are not oppressive states. So it is not, it is not the sort of a, co a contest of whose civilization is superior. Uh, because I think that, that, that is really a waste of energy and, 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 and the privilege of, of what we have here. But it's a question of what, what are the fundamental problematics in the conception and understanding and so that we can, whatever it is that we have, we can improve and so on. That the Prophet's state in Medina, I say, is too exceptional to be relevant. It's too exceptional to be relevant. Meaning that if you believe to have a, prophet, a state in which a prophet is, is, in, is ruler, then that's not comparable to any other state. It's not even a state in any coherent sense. Uh, well, from a Muslim perspective. Of course, for the Jews and Christians of Medina, it was a state we, and we, with which they had good times and bad times in terms of the Charter of Medina and, and struggles and, and, and that people like Gordon Ruby in the room, I wouldn't uh, uh, presume to, uh, to, to speculate further. But the point is that from other perspectives, it was a state. For a Muslim, it was, it was too exceptional in the sense of being ruled by the Prophet to be really in any other sense comparable to other states. But from Abu Bakr, definitely. But the point is that what I said earlier that a non-religious state does not necessarily mean a secular state in the sense we mean today. So the state was not religious, but that doesn't mean that it was secular. It was partisan to a religion and to a doctrine within that religion. And a lot of suffering among Muslims, like the Druze we heard, or others who suffered for that partisanship of the state. So the state was not neutral regarding religious doctrine as we would like it to be today. But the possibility of a neutral state is here now and we need to protect it, to uphold it, and to live by it, Muslims and others. Regarding the Quran, the, the, the Quran verse say yes, meaning that we have revealed the, 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 the Quran and we are protecting the Quran, but how? I mean, you say, just read it, but the question is, how is God protecting the Quran? Through the human. My point was to say that what we now accept as the Quran is to us the Quran by virtue of the fact we accept it as such. There is no other way of verifying or vindicating the authenticity of the Quranic text except through this chain of narration, generation after generation. Uh, so it is the Quran, it is, it is recited, and it is in its recitation, generation to generation, that it is preserved among the community of believers. But not by virtue of that you have an original certified text 
you know, we don't have a text sitting somewhere which is certified and stamped as this is the original and you compare in other texts to it. It is the fact that we recite it generation after generation. That is how it is preserved. But my point about that is not to challenge the authenticity, but to emphasize the centrality of human agency. Regarding the Quran itself in the sense of how we come to accept it to be, regarding the Sunnah, regarding what it has come to be and accepted by us, as well as our interpretation of it. So that is how central the human agency of the Muslim believer is. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, one question. Uh, you had mentioned before that uh, Sharia uh, would be both a socializing factor and a socialization uh, amongst Muslim communities earlier in your speech. Uh, and you particularly noted that the state was a geopolitical institution. Yet another conceptualization of the role of the state is a forum for socioeconomic realities of a community. If Sharia is part of the fundamental socialization and social identity of a people, and the state serves as both facilitator and medium for the socioeconomic realities of a community, how can a state possibly not institutionalize certain aspects of its fundamental culture, in particularly in this age of globalization? No, the state can and do. But my point was not to say that normative, ethical, cultural principles and practices and institutions are not relevant to state policy and law. My caution is not to claim them to be Sharia as such. Meaning that if the state said we want to prohibit interest banking, someone proposed, of course the state does not act. I mean, it's, we say the state is, it's, it's always someone who does. It's a human being, it's a political party, it is a leadership. So someone proposed that let us prohibit interest banking. I will say fine if you say why without saying because it's haram. That is because it's religiously a sin. So yes, we, our, our social institutions, economic, political institutions, will reflect our religious values and other values. Religion, whatever, however you define it, is not all the exclusive source of our identity and, and the foundation of our socialization, our social experience. But it is a significant part of it for some people, for those who happen to be believers. But those who never agree on what it is that they believe in. And that is the, the, the point about how we need to keep the state neutral precisely because of our tendency to disagree. Uh, and, and because some of us would like to impose our will through the institutions of the state, we seek to appropriate the state. The only check is for the rest of us to say no to that. That's why it is constant vigilance that makes it possible. So I'm not denying that Sharia will, will remain, but for me, it is, as I said, it remains contested and evolving. It is not a particular given understanding of Sharia as fixed, take it or leave it. Because whatever it is, it is some human understanding of it. That's what I meant by saying that Sharia is secular. I'm denying the claim that someone has access to a, a divine understanding of Sharia that is not subject to human agency of that person. If it is your agency, it could be mine too. And that's why I need a secular state to, give my, 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 to secure my access to being an authoritative theologian or authoritative, to authoritative theology, not authoritarian theology, that Frank mentioned earlier. Yes, sir, over here. Yes. My name is Kemal Koruju, and uh, my question is, uh, I'm trying to understand the type of government that you were proposing or you were trying to describe. Um, perhaps I'm projecting my own opinion on your speech, but I wanted to clarify this that to establish the equality and the freedom that you were talking about, it seems like the government has to be a weak government, not a strong government, as far as its involvement in the society. And if it is a strong government, then we are not really talking about equal rights for everybody, but equal limitations for everybody. Um, if I guess from your accent, uh, you know, we, we have, in fact, the manuscript that we mentioned 
uh, that uh, Frank mentioned earlier, uh, which is on our website, has a chapter about Turkey, the contradictions of authoritarian secularism. That is, for, se for a secular state, for a state that claims to be secular, and is, uh, which is undemocratic or authoritarian, it is not secular to the extent of its authoritarianism and lack of democratic accountability and so on. Now, the, I did not seek to try to, to de describe a type of government. I was talking about a type of a state. And I did try to distinguish between a state and a government. The government is a reflection of the politics of the day. And the state is the continuity of institutional authority of the state beyond the government of the day. And that is a tension I try to acknowledge, meaning that it is not going to be, it's not uh, sort of programmed. You can say, okay, here's the state and here's the government and sit back and wait for them to work together. That we have to keep the state, the government from taking over the state. Now, I'm talking about the state that is neutral institutionally regarding religious doctrine. The government will be as weak or as strong as authoritarian or not as we make it. So my point is how to keep the ability of people to make and change their government into a weak or strong. I, I tend to be cautious about the notion of weak government because that implies lack of social responsibility for social services. I need, in fact, a strong government and a strong state, not a minimalist state, because there are certain segments of the population who need services and protection. But so, do, so long as our system is democratic and constitutional and citizenship human rights respecting, then we can fix whatever is wrong with our state or our government. But to the extent that our systems, our institutions are weak, then uh, even a weak government, the Sudan government is a weak government. It is an extremely problematic government for the people of Sudan. So a weak government is not necessarily a good government. And a strong government is not necessarily a bad government. It is, it is what it does, not how strong it is or not in that way. I don't know if that makes sense. Hi, I'm Rabia Ben Halim, a 1L student here. I have a few questions. My first one, and I'm by no means any scholar, mm. but it seems to me that your main contention is that the state shouldn't legislate Sharia because then they will be able to control your Nia. But I guess where I'm feeling confused, it seems to me that the state can legislate your action, but they can't legislate your intention. So you may still go to the masjid because you want to pray towards Allah, not necessarily because the state has, the state has legislated it. So that's my sort of first question is, I see how it could limit your ability to be Muslim, but I don't think that it negates your ability to be Muslim. Then my second question relates to your contention that Islam and politics will always be intermingled. And I guess looking at it from my perspective, it seems to me that the one of the bigger issues, rather than just that the state legislates through Sharia, is that the state funds uh, the shaykh and the imams and also appoints them. So you have state control over the leadership of the Islam within those states. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could speak to that issue. And then my final question um, is just, you were mentioned that you see the Sharia as being living and vibrant and having a future, and how do you see that evolving and what actors do you see taking place in that? On the last point, I see you. <laughs> uh, because, I mean, you, you start by saying, I'm not a scholar, I'm this, other. that is exactly what I'm seeking to challenge, to say that let us not underestimate our authority. A remark I made during the, our workshop, I said that religious authority is in the eyes of the beholder. Meaning that anybody is authoritative to me only to the extent I concede authority to him or her. So it is, I am the source of authority and authorization, not the claimant of the authority. So the, the ulama, the imams, the state, is only to the extent that I concede. But seeking my humanity, my human dignity and citizenship, I refuse to concede, then no state can be authoritative or a religious leadership to be authoritative. And I, I really also feel that you know, if I can make a generalization, I say that Islam is radically democratic theologically. But Muslims have always tended to be very hierarchical and authoritarian sociologically. Meaning that 
we often say that there is no church in Islam, but in fact we make it even though it is not there. I mean, sort of clerical hierarchy and authority. So the problem is how to dispel this sociological dependency, which is ironic because we never abdicate responsibility even when we abandon or fail to uphold it. We are responsible even for our failure to be responsible. So in, in that sense, I think that the point is that when you say the state can limit my freedom uh, to be a Muslim but not deny the possibility, why should it do any of that either? So my point is that keep the state out of it. Whatever it is, it can neither force me to go to the mosque or not to go to the mosque. For me, it is as offensive and as problematic from an Islamic point of view, in my conviction, to be forced to go to the mosque as it is to be denied to go to the mosque, the right to go to the mosque. I must go voluntarily or stay out voluntarily. That's why for me, this belief is critical to belief. I cannot logically believe. Belief has to be a choice. What is, what is the other to, de, to, to believe? Disbelief. So th th those are the ideas I can say that, that, is, that the, the question is not to st allow the state to do any of that, neither to force me to go with or without conviction, or to prevent me from going or not going with or without conviction. That is my business, not the state business. And my, my, the, the need to, to, to challenge sort of the vibrancy of Sharia is very much on you. It is never going to happen except when you make it so. Because that is what I ended with in terms of emphasizing our agency. Time for one more question. Go ahead, sir. Uh, um, I'm Naveed Sheikh. I'm a one L here. Um, I actually have two questions, but hopefully they're quick for you. Um, the, the first has to do, I was hoping, I was curious to hear your uh, thoughts on the, the concept of, of beda or, or innovation. Um, uh, certainly Islam started out as, as heresy when it started, but, but throughout its history it's been, uh, there's been an, uh, quite a tension between it as an orthodoxy and all the other heresies that have come up uh, as, it's, as it's developed historically. And one of the thing, one of the arguments always made is that's beda, or that's a, a beda meaning innovation. That's that's against the tradition or, or the notions that were first developed at the time that Islam was created. And this can apply to things, political concepts, or even to social or just um, the customs you have in your day-to-day -day life. So I was hoping to hear you kind of con um, talk on that. And then my second question is, uh, recently in Iraq and Afghanistan, they've created constitutions uh, for these nations with uh, de democratic, uh, as they claim, and then, but they've also incorporated a lot of Islamic uh, or Sharia notions into them. And I was just wondering if you've t gotten a chance to look at them and, and kind of con con uh, com comment on how they've tried to incorporate those two based on your ideas of state versus government. Mm, okay. Uh, on the first point, I, I thought I did talk about heresy as, as yeah. critical to, to, that every orthodoxy started as a heresy. So I do not accept the claim that when someone says, this is a bid'ah, this is an innovation, I say who speaks. Uh, it is a human being who is expressing an opinion that in his view, this is a bid'ah. To me, that is not conclusive. I will not accept it unless I'm persuaded that it is. And also, in terms of bid'ah uh, as innovation, what is our life is to be without innovation. You know, imagine, I mean, if we are still, uh, what, how would you define innovation and where would you draw the line? Uh, and so people who use internet and sort of uh, satellite television, uh, the telephone are calling about, uh, talking about innovation and bid'ah. That is an innovation, that is a bid'ah. It is not only uh, invoking notions of democracy, of consensus, of all of those. Those ideas can always be for someone a bid'ah. So my point is that heresy is critical, that every orthodoxy started as a heresy. Ibn Taymiyyah, who is the sort of the orthodoxy of the Islamists of today, was deemed to be a heretic and imprisoned for it. So if it wasn't for the heresy of Ibn Taymiyyah, we wouldn't have had Bin Laden and we wouldn't have had the Wahhabi doctrine in Saudi Arabia. So the most so-called orthodox, the most so-called authoritarian, trace their origin to a bid'ah to a heresy. 
I'm not saying that every heretic is right because I have the opinion, the, the, the right to, to judge what is right and what is wrong. But I'm saying I would rather keep the possibility of bid'ah of heresy and keep my right to judge it than to give someone the right to suppress it in the claim or in the name of suppressing bid'ah. That is why I need a secular state to protect my right to be a heretic. Of course, when I am a heretic, I don't believe myself to be a heretic. And that is a point. In fact, I believe to be more to the, true to the doctrine than those who call me a heretic. But that possibility, I need to keep it in the state. And that's what I'm talking about. On the question of constitutions of Iraq and, and Afghanistan, these are not constitutions. A constitution that starts by saying Islam is a religion of the state is a contradiction in terms. A constitution has nothing to do, it cannot name Islam or any religion as the religion of the state. The state cannot have a religion. And any constitution that embodies principles of Sharia in an understanding that discriminates against women, discriminates against non-Muslims, is a contradiction in terms. The essence of constitution is fundamental rights of equal citizenship of men and women, believers and non-believers. Any constitution that fails to uphold that, not only in a Bill of Rights, but in every aspect of the constitution, is not a constitution worthy of the name. Of course, people will call it a constitution, it's a capital C, and they will publish it on websites. But to me, that's what I look for. If you identify the state with a religion, you are out of the game, as the Americans will say. If you discriminate against any citizen, and for my, by my book, any human being, on the grounds of religion or gender or race or, and so on, then it is not a constitution. With all due respect, the so-called constitution of Afghanistan is not a constitution. And the so-called constitution of Iraq is not a constitution. But this can be part of the process of building. Because constitution making is a process, not an event. And the American constitution was a time when it was not a constitution, obviously. When this constitution permitted slavery, it was not a constitution. Now we celebrate 250 years or 200 whatever years of the American constitution. To my mind, it is progressively becoming a constitution. But it was not at the beginning. If it took a constitutional amendment to give women the right to vote, all the time that this country and this constitution did not give the women the right to vote was not a constitution to that extent. A constitution that permitted slavery was not a constitution until that was over. And the constitutional system and order that did not secure fundamental civil rights, and we are still waiting for that to continue to happen. That is the nature of it. That we are never past the goal line, what do you call it, goal? It's never over until it is over in the sense that we pass on to the next word. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Anaim has graciously agreed to have, join us all for a reception. I thank all of you for coming today. I thank the Curry family for making this possible. I thank you, Professor An Naim, for your words of grace, your words of wisdom, your words of challenge, your words of passion. And I pray that we may all learn from Professor An Naim as we go forward. One minor request, at the back we've got little forms that would be helpful to us in the Center for the Study of Law and Religion. If you would fill that out just real quickly to tell us how you heard about this event as we attempt to market and get this word out in future weeks, months, and years to come. Thank you very much. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.